Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Michael Rosenfeld, Vice President of National Production at Twin Cities PBS, and one of the executive producers of this film. Twin Cities PBS is one of the small group of stations that produce for the PBS national schedule, and we were thrilled to partner with WNET and American Masters on this project. What you just watched was about 35 minutes long, just a fraction of the 80 minute film um, that, uh, um, that uh, Mary Murphy and team produced. We hope you'll tune in to watch the whole show December 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern, seven central. I wanna take a moment um, before we begin to thank the funders who made this film possible. We would not be here tonight without major support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. We'd also like to thank the Leslie and Rosalind Goldstein Foundation, and of course, the members and friends of the WNET group in New York, Twin Cities PBS in Minnesota, and PBS members across the country. We have a, a really terrific panel tonight, most of whom you've already seen in the film. So let me quickly introduce them and we'll get going. Um, Mary Murphy um, is the award-winning filmmaker who wrote, produced, and directed this film. Her previous film for American Masters was about Harper Lee. So you could say that revealing biographies of literary giants is one of her specialties. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, Pamela Smith Hill is a Wilder biographer, the author of Laura Ingalls Wilder, A Writer's Life, and the editor of Laura Ingalls Wilder, Wilder's Pioneer Girl, the Annotated Biography. Christine Woodside is a journalist specializing in the environment. American History and Mountain Adventure. She's the author of Libertarians on the Prairie, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Rose Wilder Lane, and The Making of the Little House Books. Um, William Anderson is a Wilder biographer with numerous books to his credit, including the selected letters of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Linda Sue Park is a renowned writer for children. She's published six children's novels and five picture books and won the Newbery Medal for her novel, A Single Shard. And someone from, from the show business side of the equation, uh, Dean Butler is an actor and producer of entertainment, sports and documentary programming. For our, purpose, for our purposes, by far his most important role was as Almanzo Wilder in the TV series. Okay, we have lots to talk about, so let's get started. So um, Mary, I'd like to start with you. Um, and I have to say one of the things that really struck me in the film, even in the excerpts that we've all just seen, is that there are so many themes that you touch on. So many themes connected to Laura Engels Wilder from myth and truth to family, marriage, creativity, collaboration, racism, politics, how we understand our, our history. Did you expect to encounter such rich material and faced with um, such riches, how did you decide what to focus on? What was most important to explore in the film? Well, you, uh, I didn't expect this much. I mean, you always hope for more. I mean, on the surface, if you looked at it and said, oh, adorable, kindly grandmother type writes books about triumphant, happy childhood and happy children read them. I mean, of course you want more. You hope there are more veins and underpinnings that you can find and mine for yourself in ways that other people and researchers haven't. That it was so rich and the distillation process so um, difficult. I mean, I, I'm afraid to face the people on the panel because I had to take years and years of their work and try to get it across, you know, in, in 30 second sound bites here and there. And everybody's done such amazing full bodied stuff already. So, um, it was really difficult. I mean, eight books, you want to get across an appreciation for the books and why, but then, um, you know, her life was really quite extraordinary. And I think for me, when I finally winnowed down the history, the frontier myths and mythology, the books there and their impact, I, I decided that the really important thing to do here was to focus on her life. This was after all American masters, this was her biography. And so, we, I tried to really zero in on critical episodes and things and things that um, made her who she was, you know, and her writing and her writing what it was. And um, I left a lot out, and I'm sure every one of you can tell me what that was later. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think at least for me, watching the film, 
you just have this sense repeatedly, you know, of, I didn't know that. So what, what really surprised you? Was there, was, was there a moment when you discovered something that, that really- uh, you know, I think, I mean, I am, I am eternally fascinated by her relationship with her daughter, by the completely different childhoods they each had given their very short uh, distance between them. I mean, they were uh, 17 or 18 years apart, uh, Rose and Laura, and the way they talked to each other and the way they collaborated was, was um, I mean, I knew, I knew the broad outlines of what had happened, but to be able to really get in the archive and mine all that was just fascinating. And, and, and you know, the fact is we have these letters and so we really know. I mean, the other thing that was hard for me um, was you're longing to hear from Laura. You wish there were diaries. You wish that, you know, you could, that there was a day when she sat down and said, I'm not sure Pa's plan is exactly right here or, you know, or, or something. But, um, but the fact that she led this far more difficult life than she ever led on, than she ever wrote about in, in, in all her books. Um, and she never complained. She, you know, she and and what she made of her life and her circumstances, I, I just thought, as I say, was remarkable. So, sorry, that's a long answer. And um, no, it's an interesting answer. <laughs> um, um, you know, you, you ended the the opening tease with a very potent line from Laura, read by Tess Harper: "All I've told is the truth, but it's not the whole truth." So, um, I'd like to dig into that just a little bit. Um, it seems a lot of attention has been devoted to what's true in the Little House book versus what's been glossed over or left out. So for, for, um, for the wilder biographers among us, is this an important question? And what does it tell us about Laura Engels Wilder? Whoever wants to answer first. Well, I'll jump in here. Um, I think what it, I, I was long fascinated with the differences between Wilder's real life and what went into the books. And that's one of the reasons why I was intrigued with writing the biography in the first place. What I've come to realize in the end is that the differences are profound between her real life and the life she gives her fictional counterpart. But what it reveals to me is that Wilder had a clear grasp of what she wanted to do with her little house books, that she knew how to tell a really good story and she knew how to edit, to revise and reshape elements of her life to tell a better story. And I think that reflects her brilliance as an artist and as a writer. And I also think that's probably one reason why the books have endured. Creativity, I think is revision, you know, you, you go through a process of creating something and you work it and work it and work it and work it. And I think as, Pam's, as Pamela is suggesting, uh, this was a process and she winnowed down the story to get to the place that she wanted to get to, to entertain the audience that she had determined she was going to communicate with, which was young people and wanted to inspire them and give them a sense of her life that was comfortable to deal with challenging at times, but comfortable and not threatening. And, and I, I think it's beautiful for that reason, but it was a process. Yeah, and, and you know, I would imagine that, um, that in, in at least some or many cases, some of the things that she left out, she left out because her audience was children. I mean, would, would you agree with that? Um, Pam, I, I absolutely would, yeah. yeah. And I also wanna to say too, that um, something that we forget is that because her books are so timeless and we're still reading them in, in 2020, we forget that she was writing in the 1930s and 1940s. And the conventions in children's literature and in young adult literature, in fact, young adult literature hadn't formally been invented yet as a category, uh, were much tighter, much stricter than they are now. And in a way, um, Laura Ingalls Wilder was pushing the envelope of what children's literature and young adult literature could do in the 1930s and 40s. And yeah. so all of us who are writing. Oh no, I think you might have frozen. Uh, Pamela froze. She did, she yeah. froze. She froze. Middle She'll grade and young adult back. fiction. She's back. Great. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. 
Um, um, I'll, I'll jump in here for a second and just say that I do think um, Laura, with the help of Rose, of course, I have to add, uh, was very careful about what she left in and took, you know, what she wanted in and wanted out. It was very deliberate. Uh, but I also, um, I, I, I think that she backed into being a children's writer a little bit. In the beginning, she was more thinking maybe she would be an adventure writer, a um, mm -hmm. little bit of a Western adventure, kind of real gritty life because she knew her life had been gritty. Um, but I think that uh, as time went by, she, she sort of chipped away to who she really was underneath, which was getting to the, the values, the, the mm -hmm. family values that she carried with her. You know, um, Bill, I, if I, I just wanted to turn to you for a second and ask you about something that I've always wondered about. I mean, it's sort of a truism that, um, that Wilder shaped our understanding of the American frontier. Um, you know, what does she get right and, and what, what does the historical record tell us she gets wrong or leaves out? I mean, if she's mythologizing just a bit, how does she do that? Well, I think that for illustrating the famous Garth Williams said it best. She saw her life as a child through rose colored glasses. And he meant that she emphasized the beauty and the enjoyment that she had as a child, running along Plum Creek and doing very, very simplistic things that children of her time as a writer and our time would not find very exciting whatsoever. So she was able to make those very simple things into many adventures in as the chapters of her books progressed. And that's what made them so appealing to the children that she was writing for. And I've uh, been to the banks of Plum Creek a number of times. And I look at the families that are there from the Twin Cities, and they could be from Houston or Boston. And they're having a wonderful time splashing and wading in Plum Creek in the 21st century. Yeah. And I think that was what Wilder really, really caught and made her uh, stories, which were sometimes rather mundane or hard, into an adventure story and something very pleasurable. You know, the, the, other, the other thing that really, I think, uh, jumps out at you in the documentary is, you know, the, the, the vivid personalities around her within her family, um, which I think, Mary, you, you captured so well, and which, of course, really come through in the books. Um, it's striking, the, the, the narrative of, um, of Pa in particular, um, I think it's really striking the way, the way, what she chooses to write about, what she, what she leaves out. Uh, it's really a, a curated portrayal. Um, and yeah. Pamela, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. What do you think is at work there? Laurie was wilder in many ways idolized her father and she talks to Rose in a letter um, describing Pa as being a, a, a hunter, a poet, a musician. And he wasn't a businessman. And so I think she concentrated on that side of him that had a certain romance. But in fact, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Charles Ingalls struggled financially um, as many pioneers did in the American West. And so we can see the differences between her real life in Pioneer Girl, for example, where she was a little more unvarnished in her memories versus um, the little house books. So at one point, Pa has kind of reached rock bottom financially. They can't make ends meet and he packs them up in the wagon under the cover of darkness and they sneak out of town without paying the rent. Now that's certainly something that Lauren Gilles Wilder would never include in the little house books that would indicate a certain amount of failure. So I think Lauren Gilles Wilder tried to portray her father in a very romanticized way. She loved him. She felt a real bond with him. Um, but life was definitely much harder. So when you think about uh, when you think about the time that Laura wrote the books, 
uh, starting in the depression when things were really, really difficult for American families. The idea that children could pick up the books and read the books and see a vision of family life that while maybe it wasn't easy, it was challenging, but that it was, it was hopeful. And, and I think that that's what Laura captures as she, as she writes about her father. Um, he's this wonderful, heroic, generous character. And despite the fact that maybe he wasn't a financial success, I think we do get the sense that he was a hopeful, positive character. He maybe was not as um, organized in his movement westward as we want to, uh, as Laura writes that he was, that he was a little searching, but that he was a good man. We always know, we always sense that he was a good man, yeah. other than maybe getting in the wagon and, and disappearing uh, before the sun comes up. Uh, what a, I, so. I could just add one more thing here too. Um, despite the grittiness of Pioneer Girl, um, despite how um, grim their financial prospects were, it's very clear there were dysfunctional families all around the Ingalls family, but Pa and Ma, Charles and Caroline Ingalls provided a very warm, loving environment for their daughters. And, and that I think comes through very clearly in both her memoir and in the Little House books that seemed to be something that she carried with her the rest of her life. Yeah, you know, um, someone uh, comments in the film um, about what a, an unusual father Paul was for the time, that he was essentially a modern father in the sense that he was so engaged with, with, his, with his children. Um, and there's, you know, with respect to, to Almanzo, um, a similar comment about kind of what a modern sort of a husband he was. He, someone calls him a sort of proto-feminist. Proto yeah. um, it's just, it was just striking to me that here are these two male figures in her life and both of them have this characteristic of somehow being ahead of their times. So is that, I'm, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it, but um, it's certainly interesting. Well, I, I love the, uh, in these happy golden years, uh, as he's proposing to her and, and, and asking if she'll take the ring. And then later she has to come, she has to state very clearly to him that she's not going to say obey in the ceremony and that everyone's yeah. fine with that. Uh, that every, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's lovely. It's, it's, it's prescient for the future. Um, I think she's very enlightened. And, and she writes these men in her life as being very enlightened men. I think it's very hopeful and positive. Yeah. Um, by the way, just for, just for all the people watching, um, that was one of the scenes that we didn't have time to include in what we showed you tonight. But it's a wonderful scene and a very good reason to tune in on the 29th. Um, Mary, I, you know, another scene that I think um, is really interesting with respect to um, you know, the decision that she ultimately made about what to include or not include is this sort of tug of war between Laura and Rose over Mary's blindness. Um, and um, is that something you found in the letters? I mean, I was really struck by how well that came to life. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that's a, I, I just wanna say one more thing about Pa. And I mean, I think if you are a girl uh, who grows up in any kind of hard time or any kind of good time, if you have an accepting father who's right there for you, you have a lot of confidence. You're the kind of girl that will say, I know who I am and I'm not going to say obey in my wedding ceremony in the same way that Harper Lee's father raised these two independent, never married, very progressive women. One became a lawyer, one became a novelist. And you know, I, I think if you've got that behind you at, at a very young age, it's very easy to plant your, plant your flag and stick with it. But anyway, to get to Mary's blindness, that I thought, um, that exchange between Laura and Rose was a very good example of how they work together, you know, and Rose was the dramatic storyteller who liked things, the plot points to go neatly in place and, um, and knew a good knew a good yarn when she could weave it. And in fact, Rose herself had written these kind of uh, first person trumpeted account of stool pigeons and 
robber people in, in the paper when she worked in San Francisco. But what Rose said to Laura when they were going over what to do with um, By the Shores of Silver Lake, she just said, well, why does Mary have to be blind? <laughs> You know, it just doesn't really help the story, you know? Um, and I, I mean, she, she basically said, it's kind of a downer, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and Laura rocketed right back and said, no, you, you, this, is, this is tragedy. This is how the family responds to it. We mu this, this stays in the book. So I, we, we picked it because it was the most, um, it was a big clash and it, and it, and it showed them both in, as they were, you know? I mean, to the point that that was made earlier, she really knew knew her own mind. Yeah, um, and she knew what her stories always... were supposed to be about. She needed the editing. She needed the editing help, but she knew what her stories were about. Yeah, Laura was not going to give in on on such an important historical detail. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I so think uh, that also <clears throat> helps to establish characterization in the last four original novels. Mm. And um, Mary's blindness uh, increased Laura's stature in the family and established her more as a heroine because she gave up a great deal of her personal life for his handicapped sister. And that was expected of her. She didn't want to teach school, but she was fully aware that the money was needed within the family to enable her sister to have a higher education and one author has mentioned at several different conferences and so on that Laura's early marriage might have been influenced by her desire to leave the family and set out on her own and better her life because Almanzo appeared to be a very uh, a prosperous and forthcoming possible husband for her. You know, um, uh, go ahead, Mary. Sorry. I just, I think it's really important to also add in Pam, it does this in the film, that becoming Mary's eyes after Mary becomes blind and, and Pa saying to Laura, you know, you've got, you got to, you got to help her with this and show her. I mean, that is a very, very essential uh, tool that she kept developing, which is her descriptive powers, because now she was translating the world and for her sister. And I think it's a very formative uh, thing that happened there and, and, and made quite an impact on her as a writer. Yeah. Uh, okay. can, I add, can I add one more thing about the blindness? Yeah. You know, in the series, in the, in the television series, Jumping Well Forward, um, <clears throat> Michael Landon made very powerful use of Mary's going blind in a in an episode called "I'll Be Waving as You Drive Away," which has been which has been celebrated as one of the finest hours or two hours of television in the history of series television. This was so Laura was right to leave it there, and Michael knew a good thing when he when he read it dramatically, and and he made good use of it. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit um, because you know it strikes me that we are we are we're all adults and we're having quite an adult conversation, but in fact these books were written for children, and um, so let's just adopt a kid's eye view for a moment and think about that. Um, uh, this might be a good question for for Christine. What was it about the books, do you think, that made them so popular with children and their parents when they were first published? And what do you think accounts for their popularity today? Well, I think Laura was uh, an adventure heroine. Uh, um, you know, I grew up wanting to be like her. And, and that is the part of her that is so authentic to me in the books that she was straightforward. She couldn't really lie. She wanted to be strong. She was in a family of girls where she had to help with all sorts of work that maybe she wouldn't have had to otherwise if there were boys around. And there was just something so unvarnished and, and straightforward and strong and honest about her uh, that you just wanna be like, I wanted to be like her. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people felt that way. So there are, there are a lot of, different values and ethics that come out in the books 
But to me, the strongest one was this um, sort of ad adventurous spirit mm -hmm. that she uh, brought out in, in, the, in the story. And I think as a real woman, even though I, I think um, she probably was pretty prickly as a real person, but I think she was that way in real life as well. She was just like, this needs to be done and I'm gonna do it. And um, yeah. her life was, you know, so that was, that was the appeal. Uh, and that's why the books are so, I think enduring is because they're so authentic in that particular mm -hmm. way. Linda, let me, let me also ask you as a children's writer, um, you know, your view on, on, on that, you know, what is it about the books that makes them work for children? Is it the way they're crafted? Is it the stories, Wilder tells or something else? And I think you have to unmute yourself. Um, I think there's a couple of things here that I'd like to address. Um, certainly her work was influential along with several other writers on my own in that in her understanding of how children perceive the world and how they learn. They don't learn in giant abstract philosophical concepts. They learn in tiny accreted details. And that's where her work is so charming. Um, details that we remember 40 years after we read the book. She really, really understood that. And so that was sort of the upside of her work. Um, the other thing to remember, which several people have already touched on tonight, is that she had in mind this audience of children and what would be appropriate for them. And that audience in her time was white children. She was writing for a white audience. And that is what has changed in this country today. Um, the 2015 cohort of three-year-olds is the first that's majority non-white. Okay? So there are parts of her books that have endured and that still can give, uh, uh, can charm today. But there are other parts that do not speak to large numbers of children. And I think this is the difficulty that many of our educators, parents, librarians, and other adult gate gatekeepers are wrestling with. Mm -hmm. um, myself as a child, I loved those books and those books hurt me. And it's something that I think doesn't enter the conversation often when mm -hmm. adults are looking back at these books with nostalgia. Yeah, you know, um, it, was, it was interesting to me that in the film, Louise Erdrich and Roxane Gay, they both speak ab about their first encounters with the books. And both of them sort of suggest that um, they noticed the racist passages when they came back to the books as adults, um, maybe not so much as children. It sounds as though your experience was different, that you, this was something that, um, that you experienced at a, at a young age in your, in your first encounter with the books. I wonder if you could just, Talk about that a little bit. Um, I couldn't have articulated it at the time. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the, um, the difficulty that our education system has in that it's easiest to teach American history as a single story. This brave pioneer thing, that's what we get in schools, right? And it leaves out so many voices. And it even leaves out voices like, uh, I mean, parts of the story like Pa skipping town uh, for not paying the rent. You know, that he wasn't this idealistic hero, but that's the single story that we get, right? So um, I think that um, it's, it's so difficult um, reading those books today and adults sharing those books with young children today. As I said, I couldn't have articulated at the time, but there were parts of it that I, I have clear memories of. I was a rereader as well as a reader. So I reread the books that I loved. And I knew the parts that would hurt me that were coming. And I would hold the pages together so that I could flip two mm -hmm. or three pages at once that yeah. I knew that Ma saying something hateful, you know, or, or Pa or Mr. And Mrs. Scott saying something awful about American Indians who had black hair and dark eyes like me. And although of course I know that my experience as an immigrant is nothing like that of a Native American, it felt to me like they might have said the same things about me. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot to manage, I think, for <laughs> anyone, especially a child, this, you know, to have a book that you love, um, but to know that you're gonna get to something that's, that's painful. Um, um, do, do you, um, 
is this something that, um, you know, as a, as a child, a writer for children now that um, you, you think about, does it, does it guide your work in some way? Oh, yes. I mean, um, obviously, I've written a lot of books with Korean and Korean American subject matter, because that's my ancestry and family background. Um, specific to this conversation, Mary invited me onto the program because of my most recent historical fiction novel called Prairie Lotus, mm -hmm. which puts an Asian girl into South Dakota, uh, or rather what was then known as Dakota Territory, Ocheti Shokoi Homeland, or, or what was back then known as Sioux homeland um, and she and I put an Asian girl in that town because mm -hmm. that's what I did when I was growing up. I imagined myself as Laura's best friend, you know? <laughs> I didn't imagine myself as her, which was interesting. I was interested to hear Christine and Pamela and other people say that, that we wanted to be her. I knew I couldn't be her, I'm not white. <laughs> and, and children grasp that at a really young age, but I, could I be her best friend? And so that's what Prairie Lotus basically is mm -hmm. about, is putting, and it, it, it did take me 50 years to, um, to sort of reconcile um, both the love and the loathing that I have for those books. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a, uh, I wanna to get to some questions that are coming in from the viewers, our view, our audience, um, but there's a, obviously a very big conversation. We could probably devote this entire hour to the question of, you know, the place of these books in, you know, in our society now, you know, how should they be read? Should they be read? Um, I mean, that's a very big and difficult topic, but maybe we should just touch on it a little bit, although that's hard. But um, Pamela, I mean, you say in the film that um, you, you think it would be harmful to remove some of these passages. C can you just talk a little bit about what informs that point of view? Well, First, let me say, I think it's um, important that for young readers in 2020 and 2021 and beyond, that they need to read more than the little house books to get a sense of American history. I think Linda Sue's book, I, I recommend Linda Sue's book for um, parents and teachers who are interested in a different perspective of American history. Um, the American past is very complicated and very thorny. And there are parts of American history that I think we can all agree that we're terribly ashamed of. But I think we need to share that with young readers and have an open and honest discussion with them about how difficult our past is. Um, I fear if we gloss over and, and edit out all the ugly bits about our past, who knows how we'll be able to cope with thorny, ugly, racist issues in the future mm -hmm. if young readers haven't at least talked about what racism is in the present. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's important that those those scenes remain, but that we have an open discussion with children about it. Um, and we give them alternatives and different kinds of histories, different kinds of stories to read. Um, Pamela, I would agree with that 100%. And I would add to that, that the Little House series should not be the first introduction to that phase of American history. To give the, a fuller picture and then with that background, as you say, the discussion about the thorniness and the racism, then let's go ahead and say, okay, you might like this and kids will already be um, ready, right? To say, wait, that's not fair or whatever, right? But when they're the first, which they so often are in our classrooms, that's when it becomes difficult to, in, to dislodge that single story and bring in other voices. So swap it around. Yeah, and I'll just quickly say that the, the books are, it's a double lens of history. And I think children are sophisticated enough if it's introduced in the right way um, by, by parents and teachers mm -hmm. to say, this is something that happened. The story happened in the 19th century, but this is being told through the lens of the 1930s and the 1940s by a particular person in a particular time. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm going to turn to some questions uh, that have come in. 
by chat. Um, and um, uh, look, well, here's one that's perfect for you, Christine. Please share more on Rose's politics and how it might have been <laughs> expressed in the Little House books. And this is a good thing because I, I think there's more to be said about Rose anyway. Yeah, um, uh, Rose um, was a d devoted anti-communist, uh, um, but when she began to help her mother with the Little House books, uh, it was so much a part of her, the fabric of who she was, that even in, an, I, I believe, in a totally unconscious way, she began, as, as she was collaborating with her mother, she began a putting a little bit of that attitude in, sometimes even in between the lines. And Laura and Rose shared a lot of these uh, ideas about, we don't want the government in our lives too much. That was the basic, that was the gist of it. Uh, both of them disliked Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. They thought he was um, taking away the freedom of farmers and, and other hardworking people. And their feeling, the feelings were strong. The books are not political texts, but the politics um, crept in, in in that way because of who those women were working together. And Rose, as as she goes on in her life, as I write in my book, um, you know, her, her life after writing the Little House books, she really just kind of went off the rails. She was super duper anti-government libertarian, and she never used that word as we were discussing before we started but the Libertarian Party formed uh, as a basis of her ideas. And so, um, so that all happened later in the, in the late 40s and the 50s after the Little House Book Project was over. But I, I believe that there are uh, threads of those political attitudes that you see in, in the books um, it, here and there, especially in the later books, just because of who they were. Yeah, and isn't it amazing when, when you think about I mean, the books are, that's pretty deep camouflage. You know what I mean? The books are so, so immersed in, in the texture of, of this frontier way of life and the family. And to have political messages concealed within that is pretty mind blowing. Well, again, I don't think they said, let's conceal these political messages. Yes. <laughs> you know, let, let's, you know, manipulate people. No, um, it was just who they were at the time. And getting back to what I said before about that double lens of history, um, this was just the way they were looking at the world um, as they look back on those times. Okay, so here's, here's an, an interesting question. Um, what areas for future research do the panelists feel should be explored? I mean, that's an interesting question because it sort of gets at you know, what do we not know and what do we need to know more about? So anyone want to tackle that? I feel that Rose Wilder Lane really needs a lot of additional research, interpretation, and I think she's a very misunderstood person. And mm -hmm. as her counterparts in Mansfield, Missouri, where she lived for a number of years, said Mrs. Lane was the most under, misunderstood person that ever lived in this town. But part of it was her own doing because she was a bit of a fabulous. She romanticized pretty much everything she experienced. And that's why I think she was such a good fiction writer a good creator of very readable short stories. She looked at the minutes and the tiny occurrences in everyone's life and made them into something very romantic and important. And uh, she had a fabulous ability to take unvarnished rough drafts such as her mother's and turn them into fine jewels mm -hmm. of literature. So what, what do you think is yet to be discovered? Like what, what are, what are your quest, the questions you have about, about Rose that you would like to see answered? Well, I think that the first thing people should realize is she was very glad to exit Rocky Ridge Farm and she left at age 17. She was part of that huge sociological move at the turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century, to get a job in a city and 
the Bachelor Girls, of which she was one, uh, went into cities, went into business as she did, and they defied convention. And this was not always well accepted by her, her peers, gentlemen in business, and the families themselves were somewhat ashamed when a daughter left home to go into the so-called mm -hmm. evil cities. Yeah. And that took a lot of grit on Rose's part. Yeah. I mean, Christine, you're, um, you're pretty well versed in, in Rose Wilder Lane. Um, what's, your, what's your view on what, we, what remains mysterious about her? Well, because I have to say, your, 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 your interview, you lay out a pretty vivid picture of her as a real character, a bit of a handful, um, but sort of brilliant in her own way. Rose lived for 30 years in my home state now, my home state is an adult, Connecticut, and I think that it's been really uh, unexplored, uh, her relationship to the Connecticut scene, because she was sitting in that house in Danbury, Connecticut, corresponding with her mother, Laura, back and forth, and a lot of the work on the Little House books took place in Connecticut. And, and that to me is, I actually, somebody at a conference said to me, Chris, you need to get a PhD and write your dissertation on Rose Wilder Lane. And I went, do you want me to stay married? <laughs> um, there's a lot to learn there about that. I think that the, uh, the, the Connecticut connection and then the Missouri connection that the, uh, I love to think about the fact that in the attics, attic, the attic in Connecticut and the attic in Missouri were full of manuscripts, papers, letters. Um, yeah. We'd all love to find a, a, a box of papers that was buried somewhere and of some of those missing intermediate drafts. We're not gonna mm -hmm. find those, but um, we wish for that too. Mm -hmm. You know, and yet um, uh, the, the, the documentary, I mean, Mary, you really brought to life this editorial tug of war that it, that took place and, and um... it was very hard I have to say doing the um, uh, documentary to keep Rose in her place because there's so much to work with with Rose I mean there's so much available to you and she, I mean we haven't even talked about her whole newspaper career and she went to Albania and she covered Vietnam I mean she what the the things Rose did in 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 her career are you just couldn't get into it so you were always sort of trying to uh, put Rose back in, into perspective because the film was about Laura, but, but um, having the letters read out loud uh, the way we did was our best uh, effort at bringing that relationship to life and, and showing you the back and forth between the two of them. And I think, you know, they work well together and they're a mother and a daughter talking to each other, you know, and any, any girl has ever rolled her eyes at her mother can understand Rose's tone in some of these situations so <laughs> I mean listening yeah. listening to you talk about this just now I mean the characters in this story they sound like there's something out of Hollywood I mean they're such I mean well she had two great leading men her father and her husband and then a great collaborator in, in Rose you know I mean and that was a very different uh relationship um yeah, so, Rose was a very complicated person. Uh, too. There's so I many, so many aspects portrait. to her. I think a psychological portrait of Rose, if that could be constructed, would be pretty fascinating too. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. I, I'd love to see. The, I'd love to see the movie that goes that traces this relationship between. Me too. Uh, I, I think there's I think a movie a called Laura and Rose. Story. There's a movie called. There's a documentary called Laura and Rose. Yeah. Oh, it's a. Oh. Do you think is it a documentary or is it a drama? Or it's a Hallmark movie. Yeah. No. Okay. A Hallmark movie. Oh, I, I think, think it has too much edge it's, it's for Hallmark. I'm kidding. <laughs> that, yeah. um, Collaboration. It's a two-woman was... show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would see that. Um, I think we're pretty close to having to wrap up. Let me just um, pluck one other question here from our list. Um, what were the last writings of Laura Ingalls Wilder to be found, discovered, and published? Let Bill do that. <laughs> the first four years was discovered 
in the Wilder farmhouse after Mrs. Wilder's death, Rose simply closed the door and left. <laughs> and the original curators found there was another little house book and possibly a second one with the diary that Wilder kept on the journey in 1894, going from Dakota to Missouri. So they took those to Rose Lane and she looked at them, was not interested in editing them. She did concede and allow the diary of the trip to Missouri to be published simply to answer the millions of questions readers had about what happened next. But she showed no interest in uh, doing the needed editing and rewriting her first four years because I think she knew that would put her immediately in the role of being questioned. Well, did you help your mother write the other previous books? So she put it away and it was discovered by her heir, Roger McBride. And with a few months, Harper and brothers were thrilled to accept that for publication. Okay, well, I, uh, unfortunately we're getting a little low on time. So I, I think we have to wrap up and I wasn't sure what to ask, but let me let me ask this. Um, you know, these these books have have crossed generations. Um, you know, um, and um, and they're still loved and read. Um, will they be fifty years from now? Say two generations from now? Um, will they be read the way they have been in the past? What's the future of the of this of these books? For anyone who wants to venture that. I think they will always be around, such as the writings of Mark Twain, but I don't think they will be used as books read in classrooms as they, as they had been for 60 or 70 years. They'll be here and people will know the name Laura Ingalls Wilder, but they won't be a mechanism to educate students about the Westward movement. That's my assessment. And that would be my hope. That and that's already hope. sort of true now, too. I mean, it's happening. Oh, yes, that's entrenched already. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, if I could, I, I sort of feel like I want to interview Pamela on this because I think that the, the way these books were written and created, it, it made history and children's literature itself, right? And yes. yeah. Yes. So I mean, yes. they're just they're just um, they're just a big important chapter in literature for that reason, right? I'm not really an expert in this. Right. Well, um, yeah. Yes. But I, it is, and that's a very unexamined part of the documentary because, as I said, we couldn't do everything. But this, but the theories and the way that was done, I mean, that that was all very new and unusual for its time. So. Um, the Little House books forever changed middle grade and young adult fiction. And I, I don't know, I think I was cut out earlier before, um, but when she wrote her last books, the young adult category really didn't formally exist as a category. And so she blazed a new trail and all of us who write young adult fiction now are indebted to some of the things that she introduced, including things like Mary's blindness and, um, a scene like Mrs. Brewster and the Butcher Knife, which at the time was considered uh, too violent and too um, disturbing for uh, a novel for young readers. So Wilder opened the door for more um, gritty, more controversial, more reality in uh, children's and, and young adult literature. And um, I think that's one reason why the Little, book, little House books have endured but to read them as history in the future, I don't think that's a good idea. That's, that sounds like a, oh, go ahead, Tim. I was just gonna say, you know, the, the, books, the books inspired the thing that, that I'm a part of that has been, on, has been around now for 46 years and shows no signs of slowing down. It keeps becoming adapted with new technology. The stories that, that, were, that, that Michael Landon did that were based on Laura's books are 
you know, are incredibly enduring. And I think the series shows no signs, since it shows no signs of going away, it's going to refer people back to the Little House books. And so I think the, the books will continue to be read. Yeah, I mean, the series has never been off the air. Never. But we're air. about to go off the air. Um, so let me just <laughs> say to all of you, thank you so much. This was so much fun and so interesting. I really, really appreciate it. I wanna thank everyone in the audience for attending. Um, don't forget to tell all your friends and nieces and nephews and children and others to watch on December 29th. And I also wanna say a big thank you to Michael Cantor and the team at, at, at American Masters, my own team at Twin Cities PBS. Um, thanks and happy holidays and good night.